I can't believe it. It's my first blind date. Oh, I do it all the time. Really? Whew. You guys need? Your dad. We've got chemistry here. You feel it? I felt it. All right, Janice. <laughs> yeah, really. It's, it's awesome to be loved, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Let me just welcome those of you who are viewing us online as well. It's really great to have you with us. You know, following Jesus is the greatest thing you can do in your life. And uh, we just thank you for being a part of, uh, of this ministry as we follow Jesus and what he has to say to us. So, so let me ask you this question. How many of you ever been on a blind date? A blind date? Have you really? Okay, cool. You know, uh, many years ago they used to have a show that was called uh, Dating Game. How many of you ever saw the, are old enough to remember the Dating Game? Yeah. They asked some really stupid questions, really silly questions, and then they, yeah, it was it's kind of interesting. Of course, these days, everything's done online, right? So there's dozens and dozens of those uh, dating sites where you can put a picture up of what you looked like 20 years ago and lie about everything that you are and, you know, all the stuff you wish you were and then, you know, hope you never actually have to meet her kind of a thing. Yeah, it's one of those kind of deals. But anyway, uh, today we're going to begin a brand new series called Blind Date. Blind date. Uh, and uh, and uh, in this series, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at the time when a man by the name of Saul uh, went on a blind date. Except that Saul, when he went on his blind date, it wasn't the kind of blind date where you go on, where you don't know the girl that you're going to go out with or the guy you're going to go out with. It's the kind of blind date where he had a date with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus and was left blind for three days. We're going to be taking a look at that particular incident and some of the interesting things that surround that because there's some really cool stuff there, some stuff that I really, I guess I didn't kind of, kind of didn't expect in some ways. So we're going to be taking a look at that. So today what I want to do is begin by, uh, kind of begin our study by kind of looking at Saul's early life, uh, how he was raised, you know, his raisins, all that kind of stuff, and kind of look at that because I think that getting a feel for, for Saul's raisins will kind of give us, a, kind of help, help us to understand who he was later in life as he gained the, the, the name of, who did he become? Paul. Paul, okay, who wrote actually the majority of the New Testament. So if we can kind of get his early life and find out who he was there, we can kind of get a feel for where he's going from there. Of course, we're not going to look at his whole life. We're just going to look at this, this particular incident at this particular point. But I think it will help us understand the struggles that he had as a believer and why he became, a, became such a strong believer in Jesus Christ, an extremely strong believer in Jesus Christ. So the first thing you need to know about Saul is that he was born somewhere between two and five years after the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. That's important for us to know because, you know, later on he talks, talks about himself, he, he um, identifies himself as a, an apostle that was born after the due time or whatever, however that's stated there. So, uh, in other words, an apostle, at least the way I understand it, the way the common understanding is, it had to be a somebody who actually saw Jesus personally, actually had personal contact with Jesus Christ. So that's how come he can do that, because he met Jesus Christ personally on the road to Damascus. So he's, he was actually born somewhere between two and five years after the crucifixion of Jesus, which means that not only had Saul only heard all of the stories and the things that Jesus did while he lived here on this earth, he hadn't actually seen those things. He didn't have to actually have any personal experience in that respect. But he had heard all those stories and all, what Jesus had done for those 30-something years of life here on this earth. But now that it's been, and, and at this particular point, uh, from what I, what, I, what I can find out, he's somewhere around 40 years old. So it's now been 40-plus years since Jesus was crucified, or, or if you want to look at it in a more positive light, since the day when Jesus was ascended back into heaven, into the clouds, and was seated at the right hand of the Father, it's now been 40 plus years uh, when Saul uh, actually uh, at this particular incident. So, um, so Saul also was born in a town by the name of Tarsus in, in Sicily. Um, and, and that actually is what is known as modern day Turkey today. Uh, it was Sicily back then. And so he was born of pure-blooded uh, Jewish parents. Uh, and according to his own words, he says, he says, I am a Jew born in Tars Tarsus of Sicil Cilicia. I said it wrong before. Cilicia, 
but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, just as you all are today. So he's saying here that he's, saying, he's giving his personal story, and he's saying, listen, I was born in this area. Now, where is he now? Well, actually, he's in Jerusalem is where he's at at this particular point in time, which he talks about this city. So um, we, also know, uh, we also know that he learned the trade of tent making. He was a tent maker. And I think that we, we can safely say, or pretty, probably quite safely say, that that was the, the trade of his father or his family, that he learned that trade coming up. We don't see that too much today. In years past, before technology and, and uh, before all of the, the ease of getting around, you know, all the uh, ways we can uh, travel to different places, uh, usually that's what you did. If you were born on a farm, you stayed on the farm. You just were raised on the farm and you became a farmer and when your dad yet died, you were a farmer. That's the way it was. Uh, nowadays, it's a whole lot different. As a matter of fact, uh, over at Weed, New Mexico, where I spent a lot of years over there, uh, a lot of those young people that were over there, as a matter of fact, I saw one just the other day. Um, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Odie, Odie Prather. Do you know Odie Prather? Okay. I saw him over at the Rudy's the other day, interesting enough. Yeah. And he's one of the few that actually stayed on the ranch there and is still running the ranch. Uh, most of the kids up there, when they grew up and went to college, they did something else, moved away, and, uh, you know, that's the way it is in this day and time. In that day and time, however, uh, and, and not too awful many years ago, even in probably part of my generation way back, uh, they just, whatever it was that your dad did, that's what you did. You just did that. And so Saul learned this trade of tent making, and he became a tent maker himself. As a matter of fact, according to his own words again, he talks about the fact that he was a tent maker. And it says, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them. He's talking about Aquila and Priscilla here at this particular point. And he said, they were, uh, and they were working, for by trade, they were tent makers. Okay, so Aquila, Aquila and Priscilla, this couple that he met, were tent makers. And by trade, Paul also, or Saul also was a tent maker. So he stayed with them because they had a lot in common. They could work together and do all those different kinds of things together, following in, their, in both of their family's business. So it's interesting to note, though, let me just give you something extra here, it won't cost you nothing, that, that the tents of that day were made from what is known as hair cloth. Anybody ever heard of hair cloth? I've heard of hair cloth before, but I really didn't know what it was. Well, hair cloth, actually what it was, and that's what the tents were made out of, was a stiff, rigid fabric, and it was generally made, typically made from the hair of camels and goats. Okay, so it's kind of some... Uh, Goats probably having a coarser hair. Camels certainly having a coarser hair than what, uh, than what sheep do. I'm assuming, and this is my assumption, but I think it's probably correct, is that, that the wool from sheep was used for clothing rather than for tents, which makes sense. You know, you wouldn't want to take the good, the good fibers, the good comfortable fibers, make a tent out of it when there's other fibers that are available from other, other, other animals and you could make tents out of that stuff, which was a stiff rigid fabric, almost probably like, uh, maybe like plywood or something like that. I don't really know. But it's kind of interesting to know that that's kind of what that was about. And that's the kind of tents that Paul or Saul was involved in making, and so were Aquila and Priscilla. So, okay, so at the age of 13 then, uh, as was the custom of that particular day and time, Saul went to school in Jerusalem under a man by the name of Gamaliel. We read that just a moment ago where he said he was trained under Gamaliel in this city. Speaking about Jerusalem, speaking of Jerusalem. And that's where he went to school. Who was, and Gamaliel was probably uh, the, one of the most, if not the most, highly respected, the high revered, highly revered rabbis of that particular day and time. So under Gamaliel then, uh, Saul began his studies in the learning of the Jews. It's kind of an interesting subject, kind of an interesting, some interesting things that are, that are part of that Jewish upbringing that I think had a, a very direct impact upon Saul's life, uh, certainly then, but also in later years as well. 
Because from what I've read, the things that Saul would have been taught in that school were first and foremost the outward observances of the law. That's number one. Keep the law. Or what is known, or what was known then as the spirit of bondage. Strange, huh? They were taught that. Okay? They were taught the spirit of bondage or the outward, ob outward observance of the law. And this is all going to sound, actually to me, is, sounds really familiar, right? I, th I think you all realize and understand that you know, those things are the same kind of things that are taught in religion today, is those outward obver observances of the law. And, uh, and, and, and they, but they actually called it the spirit of bondage. Now, here's the interesting part is that even though that what was known as the spirit of bondage, they were taught that uh, uh, because later on they would learn, it, it, was, it was thought to be that spirit of, of adoption that they would be able to understand that better by first being trained in the spirit of bondage. Still sounds really familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> Horrifyingly familiar, as a matter of fact, you know? So, and, and so every intricate detail of the law would have been pounded into his head. Uh, I mean, you know, in order to pass this course, you have to know it all. You can't just know some of it. You've got to know it all, right? So it's pounded into his head, every, every little bit of the letter of the law, and he literally learned to live by the letter of the law. So much so that as he grew older, uh, and, and with probably most, if not all, of the Jewish kids in that particular day and time, I don't know about today, but that the letter of the law was pounded in their head, the keeping of the outward observance of the law was pounded in their head to such a degree that as they got older, they could just do it without even thinking. Right? I think we all can kind of relate to that in some ways because we've all been raised by parents that said, do this, do that, do the other thing, right? And there were certain things that you just don't do at your house, you know, or that you will do at your house. And as you become an adult, you begin to realize you do those things without thinking. You know, you just think that that's what life is about, you know, not everybody else. And it's kind of interesting when you get a little older, you begin to realize not everybody feels the same way, right? <laughs> you know, other kids were raised different. And you think, well, how can you do that? You know, you have to do it this way. No, you don't. So, so it was pounded into their head, the, the letter of the law was pounded into their head to such a degree that as they grew older, they could, just, they could just keep the letter of the law without even thinking about it. It was, it was like by rote, or by learning uh, the liturgy, if you want to call it that. And knowing those things without ever even having to say anything, without even having to think about it, right? Like a lot of people today were, might, may quote the Lord's, uh, uh, the Lord's Prayer. And, and probably a lot of you can just quote, quote the Lord's Prayer without even thinking about it. You can just... It just comes out, blah, 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 right? Uh, there are a lot of things in our life, I think, that are like that. We have certain sayings that we say, you know, little phrases or whatever that we say. We may not even stop to think about what they actually mean. We just use them all the time. Same thing, same kind of thing. But uh, so this, this spirit of bondage that they were taught is really interesting because... Uh, the religious training that they had received as a child was for the reason that they might receive then or be able to understand the spirit of adoption. Uh, and that's, that's kind of strange. But, but isn't that exactly what religion teaches us today is that you've know, you got to keep the rules and do all this and do that and do that. You know, do what God says, first of all. You know, matter of fact, I've said it in the past myself as a legalistic pastor for 18 years. I say, you know, just... God said it, just do it. Don't question it, just do it, right? It's got to be the right thing. God said it, you just do it. Don't think about it. You know, don't ask any questions. As a matter of fact, most religions don't allow you to ask questions. Uh, yeah. No, questions are encouraged around here. Please ask questions. I may not have the answer. Nobody else may have the answer. But ask questions anyway, because we need to study those things out, find out what the answer is if we can, right? It's important to know that. It's not, we're not saying, at least just do it because I said so. Uh, even though, you know, we, a lot of us were raised that way, maybe we may even raise our own kids that way at some point, say, you know, 
do this or do that. And they go, why? Just because I said so. Well, that's kind of way the law is too. Uh, the law is often taught is you do it just because you're told to, right? Don't ask questions. You know, don't, don't try to learn anything here. Just do it. So, uh, and, and the idea is, is that if you'll do that, then later God will reveal to you why you're supposed to do that. Uh, okay. However, teaching a person to keep the Ten Commandments is actually counterproductive to understanding and accepting the spirit of adoption. Or what I would go a step farther and say, uh, Big G Grace. As a matter of fact, in my experience in teaching Big G Grace for uh, these many years, um, that those people, quite honestly and quite seriously, uh, quite literally, those people who have had limited to no religious upbringing accept grace with no problem. No problem. They just go, that's cool. This is awesome. It's those of us who have been raised in a religious setting that say, wait a minute, that can't be true, you know. No, 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 the Bible says this over here. You know, you can't do that. All those kind of things, right? So the idea that teaching them this spirit of bondage would help them to understand and accept the spirit of adoption is counterproductive. And I'll go a step farther in saying that being raised in a religion... Uh, and, and he, I can even say that for myself. I'll speak, I will speak for myself. Being re raised in a legalistic religion, a denomination, it, re accepting and understanding Big G Grace was one of the most difficult things I have ever done. And it was only because, and which is anybody's life, but only because the Holy Spirit finally pounded it through my thick skull and said, here's what the capital T truth is. And once I finally did understand it, it was like it was like getting saved again, or maybe even like getting saved the first time. It's just like, wow, this can't be true. It's just too awesome, man. How can it be true? Yeah, and you carry a lot of stuff with you because of that. Life, uh, Paul, Saul, Paul did the same thing. Carried a lot of that stuff with him, which is exactly the reason why. And I, it originally intended to go ahead and jump into the book of Galatians and and do that. I'm not going to. But that's exactly the reason why he wrote the book of Galatians. It was because he was raised in, in legalism and said, you know, and when he finally understood what Big G Grace is about, he goes, wow, you know, no, this ain't it. Let me tell you about it. It's really cool. And so he wrote the book of Galatians to say, this is cool. You'll love it. Right? Yeah. The book of Galatians is awesome. It is. It is. It's, it's really, the book of Galatians is really what helped me to understand what Big G Grace is all about, quite honestly. It was, one, it was the book that made, had more impact on my life than probably any, any other place in the New Testament. So, uh, so uh, the fact is that this spirit of bondage and the spirit of adoption, Paul uses those same two basic phrases later when he tells directly, uh, as he, and he says directly that you can't put those two things together. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 15 he says, for you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again. There's that spirit of bondage, right? He says, no, you no, know, you can't do that. But you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father, or, or Daddy. It's a personal thing, an intimate thing. So he's saying, listen, you, you, you can't do that, the, the slavery thing. No. No, you can't put those two things. They're opposites. They're opposites. They don't go together in any way, shape, or form. You can't learn the, the, to be a slave, and then that will help you to understand adoption. No. Just the opposite I've found in my, in, in my experience to be true. Uh, those who have never even heard about the keeping of the law, uh, except Big G Grace with no problem. No problem. So those of us who are raised religiously that have a real difficulty with it. Okay, so you also know that Saul excelled as a student in the law. As a, we're still speaking about his childhood. He, he excelled as a student of the law. 
uh, because he soon became, as he grew a little older, he soon became a Pharisee. As he entered adult life, he became a Pharisee, which was basically a sect of the Jewish religion who were known for their strict observances of the rites and ceremonies of the written law. Okay, So they were, you got your average everyday Jew, and then you got a Pharisee who is a step above that. Uh, we might liken it to, you know, the, the, the common everyday person in the pew and the pastor, right? Don't ever hold me up on a pedestal like that. It doesn't work. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fail and you're going to be disappointed, right? <laughs> We're all the same, okay? But, but when it comes to the keeping of the law, certainly you can climb up the ladder in that sense because there are those who can keep the law, I mean, very strict, and the Pharisees, were that step above the rest of the people. They kept the very letter of the law very strictly and all the observances and the ceremonies and all that stuff that goes along with legalism, right? So, but, Paul, but, but Saul actually went a, st a step farther than that because in the Pharisaic uh, sect, in the Phar sect of Pharisees, he became a Pharisee of Pharisees. He became one of the best Pharisees that ever lived. Not only did he keep the, the, law, the letter of the law very strictly, but even more strictly than anybody else. As a matter of fact, I'll put it this way. If you look up in the Jewish dictionary under Pharisee, Paul's picture is going to be there. Saul's picture will be there, right? That's who Saul was. That's who Saul was. Okay. So uh, Saul's most notable religious characteristic as a Pharisee was that because of his profound zeal uh, for religion and keeping the law and those kind of things, he also became that Pharisee among Pharisees and he, he followed that to the nth degree. Uh, because what he did from there is, as he became, uh, because of his training in the importance of keeping the law and, the, and his extreme religious zeal, uh, Paul absolutely detested anyone who believed in Jesus. He knew who Jesus was. He knew what Jesus stood for. Those kind of things. So much so that he began persecuting, even to death, those who, who claimed to be followers of what the New Testament calls the way. One of these days we'll do a study on the way. I wanted to do that for years. just have never done it. There's a specific biblical phrase that's called the way. Capital T, capital W, right? The way. Interesting. So that so much so he persecuted these people so that, that even if they tried to get away from him by moving to a different part of the country or a different city or even to foreign countries, uh, Saul would simply hunt them down. He didn't care. So in his own words, he says, and I punished them, these are the followers of the way, often in all the synagogues, uh, some pretty inclusive words there, huh? He didn't skip any. He, he's going to hit them all. I tried to force them to blaspheme. What's blaspheme? Well, to say something against their, their beliefs in Jesus Christ, right? Trying to get them to, de de to denounce their faith in Jesus Christ. And being furiously, uh, furiously enraged at them, that's pretty strong words, I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities. Right? I mean, he... He is really on fire for his particular religious beliefs, right? So here's a good question. Here's an interesting question. Why did Saul detest followers of the way? Why did Saul detest and was furiously engaged against them, uh, those who followed Jesus? Why? Why? Well, how was, Paul, how was Saul trained? In the keeping of the letter of the law. What did Jesus say? It's all about freedom. <laughs> Just the opposite. No wonder he hated their guts. He, was, he, he knew in the deepest part of his being... That keeping the law was the only way to be pleasing in God's sight. And Jesus came along and said, no, you got it backwards, dude. That ain't it at all. 
Uh, that ain't it at all. You totally misunderstood everything that God wrote in the Old Testament. Right? So certainly there's going to be friction there, but not just friction. <laughs> he hated their guts. Same thing happens today. So there was a day then when Paul, when Saul's life changed drastically. Saul, a man who hated Christians because they stood for freedom and liberty, you know. It's interesting to look at Paul's writings when he became Paul later on and see how much he has to say about freedom and liberty. Like Galatians 5, once it was, he says, it was for freedom that Christ has made you free. So don't be bound again by this yoke of slavery to religion and all of its, you know, the, all the keeping of the laws and the rules and the regulations and the ceremonies and all that crap. Because this is where he came from. He came from this kind of a thing, knowing what it's like, and he says, I, I do the same thing. I'm saying, people, don't do that. It's not about keeping the rules and the regulations. It's about freedom in Jesus Christ. And again, I'm going to tell you, I've told you many times, I'm going to tell you again. Galatians 5, 1, he says, when it was for freedom that Christ has made you free. He, why did he make us free? Religion teaches us he made you free so you can keep the law. You're, now you're free to keep the law. Hmm, how does that work out? <laughs> It's an oxymoron. You can't even do that. That's why, that's why Paul says directly, why were you set free? Why were you made free? So you can be free. Period. He says later, don't, you, don't let your freedom become this uh, license to sin either. You know, that's not what it's about. You've misunderstood again if that's what you think it is. But it was for freedom. So he's all about freedom later on. It, it, it matter if you read all of, all of Paul's writings, it's all about grace. It's a big G grace. It's all about freedom. And, and yet his early life was nothing but legalism and bondage and killing anybody who felt otherwise or believed otherwise. So Luke, Luke tells us in Acts chapter 9, and we're just going to take a quick look at this and then we're, we're going to save, uh, we're going to start over next week. With, uh, with the rest of this story. Now Saul, still breathing out threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, there it is, the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So what you need to understand here is that Saul had petitioned the high priest in Jerusalem for the religious authority to persecute Christians in Damascus. In other words, Saul was actually getting what we might call a, uh, a, a, a search warrant. He was, he was getting authority, a kind of a search warrant, to be able to go into a search warrant to go into the, into the, uh, the synagogues in Damascus and to search out and to see if there was anyone there who would, who would claim to be a follower of the way. And if they did, he had religious authority as well as legal authority from the high priest in Jerusalem to bring them bound back to Jerusalem and to persecute them there. So Saul was actually getting what, we'd, what we would, would call that search warrant to, to haul them back. So However, the phrase, this, this phrase that we read a moment ago, says breathing out threats and murder in verse 1, is really kind of mild. Really doesn't do justice to what he's actually doing, because in Acts chapter 26, as Paul was giving his own testimony, he said directly, So then, I thought to myself that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. So breathing out threats and that kind of stuff is pretty mild because it wasn't, it wasn't a threat. 
It's a promise. If I catch you and you won't denounce Jesus, I will have you put to death. I'll vote against you, buddy. Hands down. You're dead. Yeah. Serious, right? Pretty serious. He was serious about what he, what he believed in. So he took a very direct and active part in actually having Christians executed for their faith in Jesus Christ. So what Luke is doing here then in this particular passage, he's actually painting a picture of Saul as a rampaging wild beast, or maybe I should say the rampaging wild beast that he was in his hateful opposition to the disciples of Jesus Christ. So let me ask you this question as we kind of wrap this up today. Is it possible... To be totally convinced that what you believe is the right thing and still be dead wrong? That's a tough question. Because I've had to ask myself that question in years past and still do sometimes. Is it possible to believe so strongly in what you believe in that, hey, you're willing to die for it and still be wrong? Yeah, it is. Which, which means that asking questions is a good thing, not a bad thing. If you don't understand, ask questions. You need to understand it. You know, if it doesn't make sense to you, uh, man, find out what the answers are, right? So it's possible to be totally convinced that what you believe about Jesus is true and still be wrong. Absolutely. It's a kind of a scary thought. Definitely was a scary thought for me some years ago uh, when, I, when I finally understood what Big G Grace is about because I, I had to really stop and rethink everything I'd been taught from the time I was a child. Uh, Mark Twain once said, this is kind of interesting, it ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. Let me read that again. It ain't what you don't know that gets you into trouble. It's what you know for sure that just ain't so. <laughs> same, same thing. Whatever you, you may know it for absolute sure, and it still ain't so. <laughs> That's what gets you into trouble, right? So Saul's belief in the one true God, and yes, he did believe in the one true God, was so strong that he willingly and purposely murdered anyone who believed that Jesus was God in human flesh. That was the problem. Sounds like Muslim extremists of our day, doesn't it? Quite honestly. They believe in Muhammad and his philosophy so strongly that they have no desire other than to simply kill the infidels. It's the way it is. That's Saul. That's Saul. You know what? It's going to take the Holy Spirit to speak to people. Always does. Always does. Always takes the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart and say, listen, here's what the capital T truth is. I can't teach you that. I can't convince you of that, nor am I going to try. I'm going to give you what the capital T truth is and let the Holy Spirit do His job in your life and say to you, what the truth is. Okay. So, 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 so go, Paul, Luke goes on in the, in to tell us in the next few verses that as he was traveling, it happened that he was approaching Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him and he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city and it will be told to you what you must do. The man who traveled with him stood speechless, hearing the boy, voice but seeing no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing, and they led him by the hand, they brought him to Damascus, and he was there three days without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Okay. 
And that's really where we're going to have to quit for today. But what I want to do here at this particular point is to say to you, you know, I ask you, well, what's happening here? Well, what's happening here is that Jesus stops Saul in his tracks. Saul is on his way to persecute Christians to death, and he stops him in his tracks and by appearing right before his very eyes, and he asks him directly about his motivation. Why are you doing this? What is it that's motivating you, right? Except that Jesus puts this question in the first person. Did you notice that? He says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And they say, why are you persecuting Christians? So why are you persecuting me? You see, God identifies, Jesus identifies directly with us. When we suffer, he suffers. So can you imagine Saul's confusion at this point? Think about that for just a second. I mean, if, if the one true God that he believed in so strongly is the one who is speaking to him right now. If the one true God, true God that he believed in so strongly is the one who is speaking to him now, then why are the words that he's hearing coming from the mouth of Jesus? <laughs> and why would Jesus be asking him, why are you persecuting me? I mean, if God's going to appear to you, you expect him to say, good job, dude, you did the right thing. Because he believed it so strongly. And yet when Jesus appears for him, he says, uh, not only can you not believe that this, these words are coming from the mouth of Jesus, but then Jesus says, why are you doing this to me, right? Because just like today, you can believe in God all you want to. You go to church every time the doors are open. You can talk about God with everyone you meet. You can study the Bible as literature in school. However, all you have to do is mention the name of Jesus one time and you're going to be in trouble. All right? People talk about God all the time. They talk about God on the radio all the time. I don't mean the religious radio. I mean the secular radio. They mention God's name all the time. But you will not hear anybody to name the name, name, the name of Jesus. Now, because it's all about Jesus. It's not about God who can be anybody, whoever it is that you think God is, when you name the name of Jesus, you're talking about somebody specific. Jesus, who is God in human flesh. Now you've defined who God is. God is a generic term. Jesus is specific. And He is God. And that's exactly what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 16 when he asked the disciples about who people were saying that he is. He said, he said you know, well, okay, listen, some say that some say you're John the Baptist, others say Elijah, but still others say Jeremiah, one of the prophets. That's, what they, that's who people say you are. And, and Jesus turned around and said, well, wait a minute. Now, the real question is, who do you say that I am, all right? I don't care what anybody else thinks. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. You can't make a decision for anybody else. The only person you can make a decision for is yourself. And that's when Peter said, you're the Christ. You are the son of the living God. Right? So, again, what we're coming to then with Saul is, is he's having to make a decision about Jesus Christ. Not about God. He's already made his decision about God. A really strong decision about God. So Jesus comes and says, who do you say I am? That's what's important. And I guess I just ask you the same question. Who do you say that Jesus is? I don't care what you think about God. I don't, it doesn't matter. Saul believed in God. Paul believed in God really strong. Stronger than, than anybody else in his day and time. Muslim extremists of today believe in God. Stronger than any of us probably believe, maybe even believe in Jesus. I don't know. That's not what's important. What's important is, is who do you say Jesus is? Yeah. Because he's the one that paid the penalty for our sin. And not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. <laughs> yeah. Why? Because the Lord is a warrior who fights on our behalf, who gave his life for us.
Yeah, there's a whole other concept there I want to discover together with you sometime. Um, let me just, just give you some things. Guys, let me just give you some things to think about. It's, the Bible says there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Lord bless you all. <laughs> we got hands.